And today we're going to talk about the rise of Los Chapitos, who, if you don't know, they're the four sons of the arrested Sinaloa cartel leader, El Chapo Guzman. He reportedly had dozens of children, but these are the four who had gone into the drug business and have the most prominence. I think Ovidio, he was the one who was just arrested. Joaquin Guzman Lopez, Ivan Archivaldo Guzman Salazar, and Jesus Alfredo Guzman Salazar as well. So yeah, write those, write those down. As of December 2021, they've all been collectively sanctioned under the Campaign Act by the U.S. government, and $20 million is the reward for information that would lead to their capture. Nepotism babies, man, I swear. They're just, uh, they're all over the place, but these guys, they're also for real players in the cartels. A lot of this reporting, this information comes from InsightCrime.org. Uh, they recently named Los Chapitos as one of the criminal game changers of 2022. That was, of course before the instance of the other week, which we just actually did a previous mini episode on. El Chapo brought his kids into the family business when they were teenagers around like, I think the late 2000s, early 2010s. And uh, by 2012, Ovidio, who goes by El Raton, was already sanctioned by the US government despite being only 22. El Mayo, which is Chapo's longtime business partner and fellow Sinaloa cartel leader, also had several of his sons working in the cartel, business at a young age as well. And it's kind of like, you know, a family affair when it comes to drug cartels in Mexico. It's really hard to trust anyone unless they're bound by blood. And even then things get, you know, tricky and messed up a lot. So we're just going to reiterate, like we've said this before, the Sinaloa cartel, it's not like a typical cartel where it's just like, you know, a really tight structure, right? Hierarchical structure where there's one top boss, like other Mexican drug cartels, like Jalisco New Generation. It's multiple separate organizations that are aligned and who often pool resources and agree on overall strategy, but they're still kind of like autonomous in a way, if that makes sense. It's important to note when we discuss the rise of the sons, which begins when their father was captured, I think for the third time in 2016, and then finally extradited to the US in 2017. Initially, when their father was arrested in, in January of that year of 2016, Los Chapitos were said to be under the protection of El Mayo, uh, El Mayo Zimbada, as they were kind of like starting to assert themselves within the Sinaloa cartel. And El Mayo, for those who don't know, he's one of the co-founders of the cartel, arguably one of, if not the most powerful drug trafficker in the world. I mean, he's smart. He plays the background. A lot of people don't know his name because he's not like Chapo. He's not out there getting a ton of attention. Uh, there's a reason most people know Chapo's name and not his. He's currently 74 years old. He's been at the top of the Mexican drug cartel world for like the past 20 to 30 years, which is relatively unprecedented. He really is like the last boss of the old guard of the original cartel pioneers and a powerful force in not only the cartel world, but the entire international drug world. Cartel watchers kind of, there are people, you know, who observe these things and, and analysts and police, all that, didn't really know what to expect from the kids, uh, El Chapo's kids with their father out of the picture. You know, Chapo grew up dirt poor. He kind of made his own way. And these kids you know, they went to ritzy private schools. They grew up, they were rich kids, basically. So Los Chapitos got off to a bumpy start trying to establish themselves independently in the drug world when in the summer of 2016, two of the brothers, Alfredo and Ivan, are kidnapped at a high-class restaurant in Puerto Vallarta, Jalisco, by the Jalisco New Generation Cartel. Kind of, you know, following in their father's steps, footsteps a bit by doing dumb shit, like, I don't know, eating in fancy restaurants in the, in the territory of a rival cartel, similar to like meeting with Sean Penn and getting tracked. But this is all, again, unlike El Mayo, who like stays in the mountains of Sinaloa, pretty, pretty shadowy guy. You won't find much on him. Anyway, after being held for several days, they were released after it was negotiated by El Mayo. It's kind of a mystery why they would release and not kill them, especially because they're one of their biggest rival cartels. But we can only really speculate on the reasoning, but El Mayo was known to be throughout his career, like a really sharp negotiator, was really good at brokering deals, even with rival cartels. And he's also, you know, vicious and he operates with a heavy hand. And there's a wild rumor that El Mayo got a member of one of El Mencho's family members. Mencho is the head of Jalisco and said, if you don't release them, we're going to kill this person. And that's what kind of helped do it in. And the truth is we really don't know uh, what's going on in like the inner workings of this stuff. I think that's the, the same for most people and so-called cartel experts, police authorities, generally very, very few people actually know the inner workings of the cartel world. Even the federales are grasping for straws and stuff and no reporter or analyst are really talking to the high level guys for the most part as they operate. 
Although, to be fair, in a totally out of character, bizarre move, El Mayo did do an interview with a prominent Mexican magazine founder in 2010. Los Chapillos get into like a little bit more trouble following their dad's extradition in 2017 when a top lieutenant calls a meeting and a power grab move, he ambushes Jesus and Alfredo and even allegedly El Mayo himself when they try to go to the meeting to, you know, to meet up with the guy. Jesus and Alfredo are supposedly slightly injured in the attack, and this is the first big test to Los Chapitos' control of their dad's organization, but working in their favor, of course, is that El Mayo was with them, and he's not going to tolerate that, and he knows how to operate, especially with kind of using the Mexican government and military to do what he needs them to do. Only a few months later, that lieutenant who had made that move is captured by the government, and even his son goes so far as to turn himself into the U.S. authorities at the border. That's how scared people were of El Mayo's sort of vengeance. Los Chapitos do get some victories, though. That's when Ovidio gets nabbed, I think, uh, in, in the first time in 2019. The military grabs him, and in, in Culiacan and Sinaloa, their stronghold, and within the hour, there's cartel hitmen just going nuts, shooting up everywhere, roadblocks, fires, hundreds of them just converge on the town. They kidnap soldiers, they're threatened to start kidnapping the families of civilians. They just terrorize the city for like four or five hours until the president of Mexico himself orders his release. I think eight people are killed, seven soldiers and one civilian, a bunch wounded, but it's a major victory for Los Chapitos. It really shows off their strength, them standing up to the government and the military forcing their hand. But the thing is, was it really on their own? One Mexican journalist said that nothing would have happened without the approval of El Mayo and that his own men were participating in the mayhem. Others have said that El Mayo actually held his men back, but like I said, with a lot of cartel reporting, it's all up in the air. Now, over the last few years, there have been battles between organizations aligned with El Mayo and organizations aligned with Los Chapitos, right? Because it's not like one organization under structure. They have different groups they work with, you know, federation and all that. But usually these allies had kind of not clashed during the days when Chapo was out and El Mayo were running things, but that has started to change. The Los Chapitos themselves were in a multi-year war with the Caborca cartel, which was led by Rafael Caro Quintero, who was one of the original cartel kingpins and partner with Miguel Angel Felix, the original cartel guy in Mexico. Quintero famously murdered American DEA agent Enrique Kiki Camarena, and Quintero somehow managed to bribe someone, and a judge ordered he be released from Mexican prison you know, he had been in prison, I think, for decades, and he gets right back to work in 2013. And he had had good relations with El Mayo, dating back to the old days, and was even rumored he was offered a high-ranking position in the Sinaloa cartel, but he said no and decided to start his own cartel. Now, this is a, a true story that uh, one day I will do a full episode on, but for now, I'll just keep it relatively short. I had a contact uh, who did a lot of like narco, um, re- OSINT sort of intel reporting stuff, and he had set something up with a decently high-level guy under who was under Los Chapitos. This guy controlled something like 200 soldiers. And uh, it took me months to get a crew together because we couldn't get a budget. No one would approve it because it was too unsafe. And um, also took me months to feel safe enough to decide to try to do it. So this guy basically was fighting against uh, Quintero's people in Caborca. And we were going to stay in his compound for like four days all access. We were like, what's happening with the guy? He's showing us all his soldiers and his weapons. His compound is somewhere between Altar and Caborca. He's battling with Quintero as this is happening, right? So we finally bought the tickets. And then three days before the flight, I get a message from my contact who's just like, dude, call me. And I just, I knew it without even talking to him. I knew something had gone wrong. And what happened was the federalities had just picked him up like literally three days, four days before we're supposed to fly out whole trip was fucked. I had a camera guy coming from Istanbul. Uh, it would have been like a game-changing doc. Or an amazing podcast episode. But um, yeah, I think the thinking at the time was that this guy was at war with Quintero, and Quintero was somewhat connected, old school, knew how, who to pay off, and uh, he might have arranged for something to happen to this guy. So you know what they say. Even the best laid plans of mice and men don't stand a fucking chance when the federales get involved. So had to had to take the L on, uh, on that one, but probably good that I wasn't there when he got raided because that probably wouldn't have worked out well for me in the future. Anyway, Quintero doesn't last long either. And a year later, uh, I think in July of 2022, he's arrested again and the Chapitos take his territory. 
And in the days after the arrest, I think around two dozen people were killed in Kaborka and nearby towns as they sort of clean house. So where do things stand now? Chapitos are now dominating much of the fentanyl and methamphetamine trade in central and northern Mexico. They've also gotten into the high-end marijuana business with a potential you know, strategy of getting into the U.S. market for business and also for laundering cash as the weed laws in the U.S. allow for a lot of shady activity, you know, still with the federal ban and without safe banking, which is, it's really just stupid. I mean, I should do, we've had people talk to us about that, about how insane it is at grow houses and storage places and places like California, how insane it's getting with organized crime, but there's a lot of cash moving around. These guys want to get involved. And there's also a quote from, uh, from Louis Chaparro, who, great journalist, and we've had him on the show. And uh, he's definitely someone you want to follow and support if you really want the in-depth cartel reporting, because he knows way more than we ever could. Quote, the Chapitos have mainly focused on the synthetics market, although the Culiacan marijuana market has been a steady source of revenue for them. So they've even begun to expand into Mexico City, which has long been an area that the cartels kind of shied away from a bit so as not to draw extra attention from the Mexican government. Frankly, it's, it's probably a bad move, but Los Chapitos, you know, these young rich kids, man, those Nepo babies, they're pretty bold, and they even have their own hashtag that people use on TikTok, which is hashtag Chapiza, where people post like, you know, young drug dealer shit, cars, money, guns, uh, just real dumb tiktok in your crimes type of stuff. But uh, check that hashtag out if you want to, I don't even know. I, I don't even know why you'd want to see it, but it's interesting. The question is, though, can Los Chapitos eventually take over the entire Sinaloa cartel? Amayo is 74, and it's been rumored that he's suffered from diabetes and other ailments. And over the next few years, he could even retire. He could be a cartel guy who retires or dies a natural death, but he's likely on his way out soon. He's got three sons who were involved, I think, in the game. Two are currently in the U.S. under witness protection after cutting deals with the DEA and serving, I think, 10 to 15 years in prison. His brother is also in the U.S. after a similar deal. He's actually free, I think. And finally, his other son was arrested at the Arizona border in 2013 and released after 5.5 years and is back in Mexico, but apparently laying low and he might be out of the game. But yeah, I mean, you can kind of see how this guy operates, right? In five years without testifying and being a high-ranking cartel guy is incredibly shady since I think the federal minimum for drugs he was caught with is like 10 years. So there's Something going on there. There's a lot of talk about Amayo and underground deals, considering he's 75 and never really been locked up. 74, I'm sorry. Maybe 75. I'm not, I, I don't know if there's a consensus on that. Anyway, he's never been locked up. All his kids keep getting like pretty sweetheart deals for cartel lords. But we'll, uh, we'll save that, go into that in more depth in an eventual El Mayo episode that we do. But when he does eventually go away, you know, those Chapitos seem to be in a prime position to take over. Like I said, there's four of them, although I guess three right now. They got the name, they got the networks, and they might well eventually take over the whole federation. Although, interesting enough, El Chapo's brother and their uncle is in charge of a different faction in the Southern Lower Cartel, and they don't appear to be aligned or getting along great. So who knows what's going to happen? Just as we were writing this, of course, Ovedio got arrested again. Uh, and if you want to hear more about that arrest, we have two videos about his arrest on YouTube. And if you're listening on YouTube, please like like us and do whatever because the algorithm is not uh, not kind to us, you know. So we need uh, we need the boost that we can get. One of those videos is with Owen Grillo, who is an incredible narco reporter and again knows everything. We're going to talk a little bit more about the arrest aftermath here, but check out those videos to fill in the gaps. The initial reports seem to indicate that Ovidio was the weakest link, sort of, in the Four Brothers of Los Chapitos and that the other brothers are higher on the cartel food chain and are gonna just keep going, right? Apparently, Ivan is the main shot caller, but the four brothers were a very tight union. On the one hand, it seems that operationally they'll be fine, but on the other, it's definitely a blow that one of them got arrested. It's a knock on their rising power, shows potential weakness in their organization, especially getting arrested on the outskirts of Kulia Khan, you know, in Sinaloa, in the heartland. It's supposed to be their territory. You're not supposed to mess with them there. A lot of analysts were reporting that they were the strongest faction in the Sinaloa cartel and that they were the cartel most aligned with the Mexican government as well. Um, and there's been a lot of reporting and speculation that various Mexican government administrations have been given preferred treatment to specific cartels over the years. And Los Chapitos were the current pick. There was always a rumor with El Chapo and Mayo, right, that they had these deals with the government. This arrest kind of throws cold water on that. So we don't know how it's going to shape up. I know... Alisco just released a new video, and 
I don't know, man. There's so much happening in that world. It's really hard for for me to even stay up to date with the, the week to week activities unless you, you really focus on it, which is why reporters like Luis and, and Owen are great to really listen to if you want that more in depth stuff. But until next time, uh, thanks you guys for tuning in. This is the Underworld Podcast, patreon.com slash Underworld Podcast or iTunes to subscribe. And uh, yeah, just like, you know, rate us, share our shit because we need to uh, get those numbers up. <laughs>